sweets, only ripe vegetables, fresh fruit and whole wheat. I'm from the old school, my household smell like soul food, bro. Hello and welcome to episode two of The Bearded Vegans. I'm Paul. And I'm Andy. And we are The Bearded Vegans, a podcast featuring our dissection of all things vegan. If you're just tuning in for the first time, you can reach us by emailing thebeardedvegans at gmail.com, and you can find all of our previous episodes on the Commentist Network at thecommentist.com. In today's episode, we'll be talking about navigating life as a vegan among non-vegan family members, moving on into a rundown of the 2015 National Animal Rights Conference, and concluding with an interview with Lauren Ornelas, the founder of the Food Empowerment Project. All right, Paul. So this is episode two, and uh, a lot has happened since we last spoke. Um, And we'll start with you. You went up to Maine and had an experience with some family members, and that sort of spurred our topic of wanting to talk about how to navigate life with with non-vegan family members, something basically every single vegan can relate to. Uh, So what was your experience like uh, that caused you to want to talk about this topic? So I went up, as Andy said, visited uh, some my cousin and her husband in Maine, and they own a very small farm. It's basically just the two of them, uh, my cousin's brother-in-law, and then his partner that uh, that work on this farm. So it's a very very small farm, and it's 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 awesome. It's it's got it's about ninety percent vegetables, but uh, there are a few animals. They have. Four goats, one of them they milk. They have a few chickens for eggs, and then they have a few pigs, which they mostly just use to to clear to clear out some of the land of, of vegetation. But eventually, they are gonna sell those pigs, and uh, I had a great time with them. It was awesome, um, but I couldn't shake this kind of uncomfortable feeling that I had about being on an a farm that had animals. And we did get to do a lot of cool stuff with the animals. I obviously love hanging out with animals. We went on a couple hikes with the goats. I did not know that goats were good uh, hiking companions, but they're basically easier to uh, easier to hike with than, than dogs because they pretty much just stick with you wherever you go. They'll stop when you stop and they'll keep going when you go. So that was a pretty magical experience for me. But like I mentioned, this whole time I kind of just had this underlying uncomfortable feeling about uh, about hanging out with these animals. Yeah, well, that's that's an interesting experience because most of us can relate to living with non-vegan family members, certainly having non-vegan friends. And uh, it's not often that that is sort of put right in front of you because obviously most of them are eating animals and whatnot. But here you have these actual live animals in front of you. So what about being with those animals made you feel uncomfortable? Well, um, I mean, being a vegan, it's, it's my, it's one of my life philosophies that I don't think that we have the right to exploit any other living creature, whether that's human or animals. So having, even though these animals were treated, let's say much better than they would be treated on a factory farm or, um, or even a larger farm, like I said, this was a very small farm, they were still, the animals were still being used for for profit basically they they didn't just have these animals just to have them they were using them for profit which i think is the thing that even though the goats were leading pretty great lives they went on hikes almost daily uh they were still being they were still being used i guess that's the thing that made me feel the most uncomfortable yeah i think that you know often people can, uh, confuse factory farming with being what vegan is, vegans are against. Um, and I uh, heard a really great quote over the weekend, actually, that was saying, factory farming is a symptom of the problem. It's not the problem itself. So, you know, when you get down to it, it's not so much how badly an animal is treated, although obviously there are degrees of cruelty and less cruelty is preferable, um, but just the fact that an animal is being exploited at all is the problem. So I can definitely see why that would make you feel uncomfortable, especially because right now it's, it's right in front of your face. Here is this animal that um, is, you know, lovely, lovely hiking <laughs> companion. Uh, yet at the end of the day, the, the family has them around because they can uh, turn some sort of profit for them. Yeah, and it's it's a bummer because I mean, obviously, I I love my cousin. I love hanging out with them. They're they're wonderful people, um, and maybe it's just and, and they are. They're definitely. I think more conscious of 
they're more conscious of let's just say animal um, animal issues than the than the normal person. But um, but maybe it's just it's just a, a product of the the culture, the fact that we live in a culture where if you're going to be a farmer, it is more profitable for you to have for you to own animals and and use the animals rather than just having vegetables like i don't i don't personally know that that's a fact but um i i mean maybe maybe that's why like that's why they have these animals is because just having they wouldn't really be able to uh to live on just having the vegetables so maybe that's a that's another thing uh that just came to my head just now <laughs> Yeah, it's certainly a complicated issue. I, I, normally, I would say, well, there's big government subsidies for animal products, but obviously on such a small scale operation, um, how many animals would you say that they have? Um, it was about, so it was four goats, there was about seven pigs, and then maybe seven chickens. And where do the, do they ever sell them for meat? Are they just using them for their, their milk? Uh, the goats just for the milk, the chickens i believe just for the eggs and then the pigs like i said they were using them because pigs are great at just if there's a lot of vegetation they'll just eat up the vegetation real quick so they were kind of they had them so that they would clear the land of vegetation and then i think when those pigs get older they are going to sell them for meat yeah so yeah that's definitely a difficult reality to, to face yeah and and I mean I think obviously because because it's my cousin and I and I love her it's like I want to I have this gut reaction to defend the farm when I'm talking about it with other people but then at the same time I'm like oh wait I I I don't agree with this I don't want I wish that uh, I wish that it wasn't this way but I it it's I didn't it's not something that I discussed with them they they know that I'm I'm vegan and they know how I feel um, but. At the same time, I felt like I felt like it wasn't it wasn't my place to say anything about it because I don't know anything about farming. I'm I felt uncomfortable saying like, no, this is you're not. This is how you should live, and like this is how the, because this is how they're making their money. And it, it was it would be an uncomfortable conversation to say like, no, you're you can't do this this way that you're making money, which. I mean, is it's funny because if this was a random person, I would have I would have no problem saying it to them, but uh, just the personal the personal family connection is what makes it much more difficult, and that's why I wanted to to bring up this topic about talking to your family or just about how to deal with it, how to deal with non vegan family members. Yeah, and I think that at, at this point, that actually splits the conversation into two sections. One of which is um, how to how to talk to people about small scale operations, even stuff like backyard eggs, um, and and how to explain that those things are unethical, at least in our eyes. Uh, and the other conversation is what we want to get to the core of, which is how to talk to family members. At how far do you push? Um, at what point? Is it maybe more beneficial to stay silent? Are you going to cut people off more than actually bring them over? So uh, that's certainly a good transition. I think we can steer it in the direction of just how to talk to family members, even if they don't happen to have a farm, if they're just going and picking up burgers at the store. And so when you're in general, when you're talking to family members about this stuff, do you talk to family members about this stuff? Is it something that you never bring up? Is it only when they bring it up? Do they tease you about it? (laughs) What's the current dynamic with you and your family and in regards to veganism? Uh, Well, first of all, I want to put it out there that I'm I'm very lucky in that I have an immediate family that is incredibly accepting and encouraging of uh, my vegan lifestyle. Uh, my dad has been vegetarian for over 30 years. And, and since I've gone vegan, he's, he's moved towards veganism. He's, he likes to, every time I bring it up, he likes to say that he's 90% vegan. Um, I, I still like, don't know after, after all this time, don't know what's, what's stopping him at this point. But, um, yeah, I've definitely had a very encouraging family and I and I'm lucky because I know other people who when they've lived at home, when they've said to their mom or dad or whoever that they've gone vegan, they've basically reacted by saying, "Okay, well now you can you can do all the cooking for yourself, you can buy all this food for yourself. I'm not going to support you at all." But um that being said, I do try whenever whenever something comes up like n- whenever something comes up naturally, 
I definitely try to interject with with some facts about how either this meat is made or or how these animals are treated. Um, I de- don't keep quiet about that because, especially because, I found that there's there's so many misconceptions that that non vegans and vegans too have about how this food how their food is made, and um, one of the most important things is just getting them exposed to the truth that that it's it's this awful stuff is is going on in factory farms. Uh, so so whenever something comes up organically, I'll definitely bring it up. Um, whenever there's like a, a vegan event, I try to encourage my my fam- my immediately family immediate family to attend something like um, there's the screening of the new movie Unity that's going on in in well at the time record this podcast it's going on next week but I'm encouraging my family to go to that um, but overall I I think just being vegan and and I'm not even saying this to kind of cop out but just being vegan and exposing my family and my friends to this new kind of food, it, it does erase a lot of their misconceptions about veganism. It shows them that vegan food can taste good. It shows them that there are easy ways to convert non-vegan food into vegan food. And um, just being vegan, I think, helps helps uh, promote the idea that veganism is something that's obtainable. And if someone was maybe hesitant about trying it out because they thought it would be too difficult, it kind of helps them to to know that they should try it out. Absolutely. There's definitely a lot to be said for being the vegan in the room, even if you're not being the outspoken vegan in the room. And I'm sure that's something that all of us struggle with is when do you speak out? When do you push back further? Uh, or when do you just sort of lay back, maintain presence and interject a little bit here and there when you can I am, I am also very lucky in that my family has been very supportive of my veganism. My sister actually went vegetarian when she was very young, when she found out what uh, goes into hot dogs. <laughs> it horrified her, and she went vegetarian at, I want to say, 10, some, somewhere cool. very young. And, of course, I teased her about it for a very long time, <laughs> as most uh, you know meat eaters do tend to uh, tease those that do not eat meat. But... My mom recently went vegetarian, which is a very nice. big step, and I'm very proud of her. And both of my parents lean strongly towards vegetarian and vegan food. They have no problem making it for me when I come over. I'm usually buying them vegan cookbooks. They're big fans of the Dr. Furman you know, camp, the Eat to Live system. So I, I often buy things of that nature for them, and they're always excited to try things. But, you know, I have some, just like you, I have some family members on the periphery that are generally pretty cool about it. But, you know, early on, especially, I had one one family member who, uh, you know, was like, uh, you better not start burning down fur farms. <laughs> and, well, what are your shoes made of? And you have to milk cows. And, and dealing with that is is hard because if it's a random stranger on the street that you don't have to see again, it's easy to sort of maybe give that tough love kind of response and and then write it off. You know, obviously you want to be the best advocate possible and usually that requires being calm and collected mm-hmm. and and just being a good representation, which is an unfair burden to place on vegans, but it is still the burden that we bear and knowing the the stakes at hand, all you know, these billions of animals that are uh, slaughtered every year for for food and entertainment and testing and whatnot. It is important for us, in my eyes, to to do the best we can to be the best advocates possible. And as far as that goes in relation to family members, I don't know if it was in the Animal Activist Handbook, um, but it was some some book I read, you know, way early on when going vegan. And the advice they gave was not to get hung up on converting family members, which I think is really good advice for maintaining your well being with uh with regards to it because you can really it'll really just drive you up the wall if you're just focusing in on getting your family members to get it and to go vegan because sometimes it will happen it's not always going to happen and if you're just so focused on getting one or two people to do this thing that they're not doing and the more you do it the more pushback you get it's not going to be good for anyone. It's going to strain your family relationships if you have good family relationships. And it's not going to help the animals because it's not going to you know, get anyone on board. So it is a tough line to walk. Yeah, you definitely don't want to create like a rift between you and your family members or even your friends because it, like you were saying, it, it can it can affect your emotional state. And that's 
it's like you want to you want to stay healthy too. If if thinking about the animals, if you want to be the best vegan advocate you could be, I mean, you got to take care of yourself as well. Yeah, so it sounds like we're both in a different position than some people might be, or maybe even most people, yeah. where we've had family members that have been supportive of it. And, you know, I have friends who, just like you said, their their parents were like, you're cooking now. And when I do vegan uh, education work for younger people, you know, high school students especially, they're great to talk to because usually they haven't been exposed to the issue before. And they're more affected by it and they're more wanting to make the change, but they're also in a position where they're not the primary food provider. And maybe they go out with their friends every now and then, but for the most part, the parents are providing the food. And if mm-hmm. they're not on board, it's really hard. And I have friends that started in high school and they took that hard route. But, uh, you know, I certainly couldn't blame someone that was in that situation and had to wait until they got out of it and were in a more, a situation where they had more control to start making those changes. And I always tell people, you know, it's about doing the best you can within your circumstances. And, you know, maybe it doesn't mean you're eating vegan hundred percent of the time. Um, This is sort of a bit of a tangent for like younger members that might be listening, but you know, do the best you can. There's ways that you can help animals. Even if you can't go hundred percent right now, if there's situations that prevent you from doing that, you can still be out there campaigning or passing around petitions or talking to your high school cafeteria about getting vegan options in there. There's lots of ways that you can help while you're starting to make that transition. Yeah. And, and like I was saying, make sure to like to monitor yourself, make sure that, that you're staying healthy as well. And, um, we're also lucky, Andy and myself living in Connecticut. We know a lot of, now that we live, we support ourselves. Um, we know a lot of other vegans. We have a lot of friends that are a lot of friends that are vegan, and again, that's that's something that's going to be difficult for someone that lives in an area where there aren't that many vegans. Because even when they're supporting, even when they they if they move out and they're supporting themselves, they're buying their own foods. It's still it's tough to to not have any support from any of your friends, any of the people that you're hanging out with. Like you mentioned, a lot of people like to make fun of vegetarians and vegans. And um, if if you're getting that a lot. It's it's tough, uh, but stuff like the internet has definitely made that made it a little bit better. I know it's it can't it's not as good as having people in person uh, cheering you on, but but there's definitely some good vegan uh, support on the internet. Absolutely, and so I've been vegan for I actually just hit my eight year vegan anniversary the other weekend. So I forgot all it happened during the animal rights conference, <laughs> and I was so busy I forgot about. It, so I didn't celebrate other than by being at this giant animal rights thing. Um, <laughs> And I, I tend to forget how lonely it is. And when I first went vegan, I had one other close friend who was vegan and a, maybe two acquaintances sort of that kind of helped inspire me to go vegan, but I did not have my network of friends and it was still very new to my family at that point. And, you know, they weren't super weirded out about it, but they weren't as on board as they were now. It's just a phase type thing. Um, but yeah, over the years... Now, I don't want to say most of my friends are vegan, but it feels like it, at mm-hmm. least most of the people that I hang out with regularly. And part of that's because I've uh, you know acquired new friends, but a lot of it is because my friends have gone vegan over the years. And many have told me it's because I was there. And obviously, I won't take full credit for that stuff, but many of them did say that you know me being there, being calm, explaining things, and more importantly, just making good food for them helped them make that transition, helped inspire them. So, you know, that's sort of a lived story that says like, yes, even just being that vegan in the room that speaks out when the time calls for it Mm -hmm. can create an immense ripple effect. And so for any new vegans that are listening, you know, just think about that. If it's your first year as a vegan, think about eight years from now when you will have created many new vegans just by virtue of being vegan and speaking out about it when you have the opportunity. Yeah, and you don't need to cut ties you don't need to immediately cut ties with all your friends that are non-vegan. Yeah, a two-year window, then you cut the ties. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, exactly what Andy said. I've had a similar experience where people say that just being, just being around them has encouraged them to try vegetarianism or veganism or just try to eat less meat. So you don't always – I mean it's good to – like Andy said, it's good to, to, to talk about it when the issue arises or you can find little ways to interject it. But like – Pounding people, like saying, like, why haven't you been? Why haven't you gone vegan yet? Like, this is what's happening. Go vegan. Go vegan. Go vegan. It's not always the best, the best strategy, and it's going to cause you to to possibly lose some friends. So, 
Yeah. And to bring it full circle to the topic at hand of dealing with family members, I view family members as sort of the ultimate long game for, you know, making new vegans because mm-hmm. that is the one where you're, you're with them, you're stuck with them. Um, you know, I hate to use the word stuck because I love my family, but you know, they're, they're your family for life. And so if you sort of mess that up, chances are it's not going to be a comfortable situation, but you know, if you stick with it, and you're there and it's a family gathering and you make a couple of vegan dishes. You know, I, my go-to used to be chocolate chip cookies. I, I was dating someone that had a very, very large family. No one else was vegan except for one cousin, but I would always bring the chocolate chip cookies and they love the chocolate <laughs> cookies. And, you know, for, for a lot of them is sort of their first exposure to mm-hmm. intentionally vegan food and meaning a vegan. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to bring it, Another full circle. We got a lot of circles going on here. Um, it's an onion. <laughs> yeah. To go back to what, what I originally brought up with going to this farm, the last thing that I wanted to mention about this was that um, was actually not a critique of the farm, but a critique of us vegans in general. And that's uh, one thing I also thought about when I was on this farm. I was like, wow, my, my cousin eats basically – 90% of her food is either coming from her farm, mostly vegetables, or um, or the farms around her. They kind of have programs where the farmers, they give each other the foods that they don't have. So they kind of exchange food. And it made me think, wow, almost all of their food is coming from uh, ethically labor, labor um, like related to labor, ethically sourced Location, so they don't. They're not coming from places where people are are either underpaid or overworked, um, and that's something that many vegans, myself included, don't think a lot about when we go to the grocery store and we buy our vegan food. As long we, I think, as long as it says that vegan label, I'm like, oh, this is a this is compassionate food. But it's um, a lot of vegans don't think about the the human aspect of their food and and where their food is coming from. And I know that's something, Andy, that you uh, that you like to think about, especially with your your shirts for Compassion Company. All your shirts, uh, as much as possible, you're making them organic. You're making them ethically sourced. Uh, so that's something that you think a lot about, and it's definitely had an impact on me. We were talking about having impacts on each other, but I um, I had never thought about t- where my T-shirts had came from before. Before I talked to you about it, talked to someone that was really passionate about that, and I know that's something that I should be thinking about with my food as well. Did you, did you want to add anything about that? Well, this, that's actually a good plug for the interview that we'll be doing with Lauren later on because a big part of the Food Empowerment Project is a very, very, very intersectional look at food politics. So they are a, you know, a vegan food justice group, so they don't promote anything that's not vegan, but they do look at the source of the labor for produce as well as for slaughterhouse workers, factory farm workers. And that is when people talk about veganism, they say the big three, health, environment, and of course the animals. I think it's really the four. The fourth is of course humans. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's all this stuff about world hunger and you know, things about the labor conditions of slaughterhouse workers and the environmental uh, damage caused by pig farms and all that stuff. But really that fourth element gets sort of left off. So we're definitely going to dive into that with Lauren, the trade-offs that we make uh, between produce, which is a big criticism that people levy against vegans, Mm -hmm. usually just you know, uh, someone once said, uh, well, the the one good thing vegans have done is they've made uh, meat eaters care about farm workers because <laughs> people don't really seem to care about produce workers until all of a sudden they're challenged on where their, their meat is coming from. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think uh, to bring it back, it's a really good question. Where is that most ethical way to eat? Is it to be working on a farm that maybe has an animal or two, or is it to be buying what most vegans do, myself included? Uh, I don't have farmland, which is go to the grocery store and pick up stuff. Where is that trade off? I certainly don't have the answer to it. Mm-hmm. I'm sure Lauren doesn't have the answer to it as well, <laughs> but it's, it's something that we hope to reflect on with this podcast. And it's only episode two, but we hope to make that a theme talking about you know, finding the things that we don't normally talk about in the vegan community and hopefully bring them to light. Yeah, because as as vegans, I think it's it's easier for us. It's easy for us to challenge non vegans on on the way they're doing things, but I think it's a lot harder to challenge ourselves or our fellow vegans about how 
because we're not, no one, I don't think anyone is perfect. Um, and I think we can always continue improving on ourselves. But uh, as, a, as a vegan, I think a lot of times we think that we've, we've made it. We've, we're vegan. We're the, ultimate, um, we're the ultimate ethical being and we don't have anything <laughs> to improve on ourselves. But I mean, the, the world, there are a lot of problems going on in the world and there are always ways, even related to veganism, like we were just talking about, there are ways that we can improve our lifestyle to live more, to live a more compassionate lifestyle. So that's just something I wanted to end this little discussion with as a kind of challenge to everyone. Just just think about ways that related to your veganism or not related to your veganism, how you can kind of try to improve your lifestyle. Continuous improvement. <laughs> that was a little plug for uh, my other podcast called <laughs> Continuous Improvement. You can check that out also on The Commentist. All right. So <laughs> Next topic. Well, I will. Can I yeah, actually yes. add one more little thing there? Yeah. This is something that I think is going to be brought up a lot. I know it, it will certainly be brought up when talking about the Animal Rights Conference shortly. Is this transition that I've seen a lot of vegans go through, which is it's a big deal to go vegan. It's certainly once you've been doing it for a while, it seems incredibly easy. Mm-hmm. I view it as an easy thing to do. But yeah, those first couple months are hard and maybe lonely and isolating and just figuring out what the heck you're going to eat and what I do with my shoes and my belt and (laughs) all those questions that most, uh, you know, any of us who have been vegan for a long time is just like you sort of take it for granted. Um, But I think also when you do that, uh, like Paul said, you're like, I am the supreme being and (laughs) I have done everything right. I'm the most ethical possible human. And then over the years you start to meet other vegans that are problematic and you experience organizations that use problematic ways of promoting it. And then you have this realization that, Oh, just because someone is vegan doesn't mean they're a great person. Doesn't mean that they're thinking about other issues that are going on. And it doesn't even mean that they've learned to, you know, rethink everything. I I tend to think that veganism for me, the reason why I like to promote it, um, is because for me, that's what trained me to, to really question everything. But I meet a lot of vegans and I'm sure I'll look back on five years on this conversation and be like, there's a lot of things you aren't questioning, Andy. But, uh, you know, you find that veganism does not mean perfection. It's a step on the path towards hopefully a more ethical life, but it's not the end game at all. Very well put. Uh, so Andy, we talked about me for a little bit and what have you been up to these past few days? Well, I've been all over the place. I drove down to the 2015 National Animal Rights Conference, which is in Washington, D.C. Cool. And I believe this was the 30th year, or maybe, I think, oh, maybe 34. I believe that the first one was in 81. That's and, awesome. Yeah. So it's the longest running uh, event of this nature in the United States, as far as I know. And... There's not much else like it out there in terms of its size and scope. There's the Taking Action for Animals conference that the Humane Society puts on. But obviously, they have a a bit of a different angle than the Animal Rights Conference. The Humane Society one is, of course, very welfarist in nature. And the Animal Rights Conference draws a little bit more of the... I don't even want to say radically minded because there is a very specific type of activism that's happening at the animal rights conference that is not necessarily the most radical, uh, but it draws more radically minded people mm-hmm. than say like the TAFA, the taking action for animals conference. Yeah. So, um, so unfortunately I have never been to the animal rights conference, but it, it seems from how Andy's described it to me that it, it differs from a normal veg fest that I've been to a bunch of those. It differs, it differs from a normal veg fest in that even though at the veg fest, there are, um, there are lots of booths. There are lots of vendors for animal rights organizations. This seems like it's it's more about the animal rights rather than like I'm sure they still had food. I'm sure they still had other vendors that were selling, let's say, t-shirts or something like that. <laughs> but um, but it seems like they're they're really pushing. Like, all right, it's like it's cool to have these veg fests. It's cool to to gather vegans together and just hang out. But now we got to get down to business and talk about animal rights and how we can improve the animal rights movement. Is that correct in saying that? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Uh, so, you know, something that will probably be brought up a lot on the podcast is veg fest because it is something that both Paul and I do a lot. It's basically what I do for a living. 
uh, is traveling to VegFest with my clothing company. Um, it definitely, it's very different than a, a VegFest. A VegFest is typically a one-day event. Sometimes it's two. Usually it's a free thing to get in for mm-hmm. most of them. And there's a lot of vendors, and the, the big the big nonprofits are usually there, and hopefully some smaller ones and animal sanctuaries. But they're kind of there to get people to learn about their organization, maybe make a donation or something. And VegFests are all about the food. That's why yeah. people go, and you know the rest of us are just sort of lucky to absorb you know the extra interest that comes when people gather to eat food and to learn about the issues or buy a shirt or. Mm-hmm. You know, pick up some other consumer good. Whereas the Animal Rights Conference is a platform for activists to speak to one another about, you know, new campaigns, improving the conference or improving the movement, also improving the conference. Um, and this year was the largest ever. There was sixteen over sixteen hundred people attending. Wow. And it's at you know it's at a hotel slash sort of convention center. Mm-hmm. It's not like one of those giant you know like four story tall warehouse type <laughs> convention centers, but it is large exhibit halls. And so all day long it starts with a, a morning plenary session, which is one sp- one or you know two speakers talking to the entire conference or everyone that's woken up at that point. <laughs> And then it breaks off into smaller panels, which will usually have one to three or four speakers, and you can pick from one of you know four or five different topics that are going to be happening, and those happen all day long until the closing plenary session. And this was my third conference. Every time I've been there as a vendor, which means I don't necessarily get to go see lots of the talks, lots of the panels. This year I was there uh, by myself as a vendor, so I was basically behind my table the whole time. But there's a lot to take in with the experience, even if you're not going to the panels. What I personally view the conference as, the most beneficial aspect of it is the fact that it's lots of activists getting together. So it's a chance to recharge and just hang out and connect with other people and make new friends. And like we're talking about, having that sense of community is really important to maintaining uh, you know, staying vegan, this is really good for maintaining activism and getting people to want to continue to work hard for animals. You know, if you're going out and volunteering with random people, it's a lot easier to kind of blow them off if you feel tired. But if it's a bunch of your friends that are out there, you don't want to let them down. You want them to give you a hard time. So for me, I feel like that's the main benefit of the conference. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I'm, I'm bummed that I couldn't make it, uh, especially because I'm relatively new to the animal Activ- to the activism um, portion of veganism. I mean, I, I like talk to my friends and stuff about it, but in terms of volunteer work and things like that, I'm relatively new. It seemed like it would have been a cool place to make a lot of nice connections. Uh, so what were, your, what were some of your highlights from the, the conference? Yeah, well, I guess before I continue, I should add a disclaimer, and that is the conference is put on by FARM, uh, which is an acronym for Farm Animal Rights Movement, which is the nonprofit that's been around for... A very, very long time. They put on a conference every year, and I'm a former employee of Farm, so I don't know if that's going to be a thing that causes anyone to go. This is why you have a certain view of the conference. Um, so I'm just going to put that on the table. I no longer officially work for them, but I will come in and do uh, occasional work for them. Uh, my capacity with Farm was on the 10 Billion Lives Tour, so I was a person that toured And did a lot of vegan education work. So I was not involved in the conference planning or any of the office stuff. But just for full disclosure's purpose, going to get that out there. And I've also volunteered for them for one day. So if anyone (laughs) has trouble with that, too, then... Yeah. So... I had a fantastic time at the conference this year. Again, I was behind my table selling shirts the entire time. But... It's a very slow time behind the table. It's just sort of a trickle of people all day long. You're never mm-hmm. swamped with people. So it gives you a chance to really talk and connect with everyone. And most of the other vendors, most of the people from all the organizations that are there are coming by and saying hi. And you know, having been involved for so long, at this point, it's almost like a family gathering for me. Um, so many great, inspiring people that work very, very hard to make the conference happen, you know, on farms half. Uh, I can't even imagine the amount of work that goes into it, you know, hosting over 1600 people. They had 148 speakers this year, over a hundred vendors. So it's really an immense undertaking and I'm thankful that they put it on. There's a, there's certainly a lot of criticisms of the conference and the viewpoint that it has, and, you know, it, it draws a particular brand of activism. It is very much a lot of the larger nonprofits. So you'll see groups like 
Compassion Over Killing, Mercy for Animals. Of course, PETA's there. They weren't there for a couple of years, but they're back. And, you know, all of those groups. And so, rightly so, there are criticisms of those groups and, and how they present issues. And that's something I'm sure we'll talk about at some yeah. point in the conference. So, uh, I'm not blind to those issues that are going on. Certainly, something that I hope that we can get a guest on to, to mm-hmm. discuss that can talk about it more in depth. But for what it is and the type of activism that it promotes, I feel that it's a very powerful conference. And I hope that it's a really good means of getting activists together so they can continue to collaborate and do fantastic things for the animals. Um, there was a couple of really great displays this year. I think what really had the whole you know conference buzzing was animal equality and their 360 investigations 3d goggle type thing uh it's really incredible i i'm totally drawing a blank on where they filmed it it was not in the u.s i think it was spain but essentially they had they don't have the ag gag laws wherever they filmed it and so things were a little more relaxed and they went to a factory farm and just said hey we're uh you know students i think agriculture students and we're trying to document the experience so we can make it easier for other students to see what's going on and they went in with the big rig and cameras pointing all sorts of directions and then you know so it's kind of like uh, an immersive 3d experience and the way that it's done is brilliant is that you just download this thing for your phone and you kind of put it in this goggle setup yeah it's hard to uh describe but it's just like google cardboard is that what it is it's exactly like google cardboard i know that's what PETA's eye chicken thing is Mm -hmm. i've never experienced it um, but it's just like a thing where you just fold this cardboard thing into a, you know, a glasses display <laughs> and you just slide your phone in there and put your earbuds in and, you know, you move your head. What they had was not cardboard. It was like a very nice, yeah, yeah. um, you know, plastic, whatever thing, but it was, it was all the rage at the conference. I unfortunately didn't have a chance to try it, but yeah. everyone said it was a game changer. They felt like they were actually yeah. in a a pig, you know, the gestation crates and it's about a four minute experience and you control where you look. So you're going through from being in the crate to going to slaughter, seeing the pig slaughter, but you can turn your head and see another pig. You can look up and you can see the, the farm worker. And to me, it sounds like it'd be very distressing. I'm, I worry actually that it might be too distressing because we know at some point if footage is too graphic, people just sort of shut their brains off. Yeah. But we're also at a point where so many people have seen footage of what happens in these facilities that maybe they're getting a little desensitized to it and stepping it up in this direction really could be the next phase for introducing people to what happens in these facilities. So is it like from the animal you're seeing from the animal's perspective? Yeah. And like the cameras are like real low down the ground. Mm -hmm. That's wild. Yeah. And it's so and it's like virtual reality basically because you can look around. Yeah, and they they um with on the actual phone they sort of, you know, break it up into two different screens. So I mm-hmm. guess it looks a little 3D okay. or you know, cuz it's a phone that's like 2 inches from your eyes. Yeah, yeah. Um so it's really great that the technology is advancing so far and that it's becoming relatively accessible. I know smartphones are not, you know, not everyone can afford them. But for the average college student that does have access to that, that could be a super powerful way to get people, you know, to go out there and and do pay-per-view activism or just to ask their friends, hey, check this out. And that'll get people to really empathize with the animals that are in these situations. Yeah, and it's definitely, it's very encouraging to see that these um, animal rights organizations are utilizing, like, the most current technology to, uh, to promote this movement, like even the ten, the like the pay per view, the ten billion lives uh, technique, or this virtual reality thing that I didn't know existed <laughs> until you just told me. Uh, that's that's it's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's just I can't say enough that it, it seems like it's going to be a very powerful tool. Cool. Yeah. Any any other highlights? Yeah. Well, so every year there is a large banquet dinner on the Saturday night. I did it the first year, and it's a pricey ticket. Um, and I, you know, wasn't going to do it again, but I was gifted a ticket to it this year. So, um, you know, I was, couldn't turn that down, couldn't (laughs) down, turn down a free meal. And the meal was just, you know, rice and veggies and like uh, match meat, which I hadn't heard of before. I'm not, I think it might be from overseas. Uh, it was just like some kind of chicken, like breast thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
honestly wasn't a huge fan of it. It seemed yeah. kind of dry, but it was stuffed with like a squash something or other, which was pretty good. Yeah. Um, but so, you know, they, they hand out a couple of awards and the Young Activist Award and Grassroots Achievement Award. And uh, the, the evening was very special because a lot of it was honoring Lisa Shapiro, who's an activist who is basically anyone I know that does activism knew her and she touched everyone. And she was very passionate, very kind. And she volunteered with the 10 Billion Lives Tour before. And we had collaborated a little bit because she also works with Tofurky. And I put out a shirt every year that is, you know, a benefit for various uh, animal sanctuaries. And Tofurky is kind enough to donate a coupon booklet or a free pu- cur- uh, product booklet to each one. So I got to know her through that. And even through that little experience, you could tell she was a very special person. So the whole dinner was about her. And cool. a- a- absolutely everything was just sort of you know, great speeches from everyone talking about her and lots of tears were shed and they played some videos. So that was a real highlight. Yeah. And, you know, any chance I can get to talk about Lisa in, in a positive light makes me happy. So I just wanted to give her a little shout out because she was a great activist that we lost this year. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so was there anything that you think could have been improved at the conference? Yeah. So I think that uh, one of the criticisms that's often levied against the conference is um, the more singular minded focus on a certain brand of activism. And they, I know they do a really fantastic job of trying to get so many different viewpoints in there. And, you know, there will often be debates between welfare and abolition and no kill shelter, kill shelter. Um, so it's not like there's just one, um, you know, one viewpoint, but it is sort of in the same kind of kingdom of activism like yeah. you know section of activism and uh i do wish that there was a maybe a bit more of a focus on some of the intersectional issues because you have vegans in a room together and something that we hope to do with this podcast is that it's kind of like vegans talking to vegans talking about some issues that maybe you don't want to be airing on your facebook page you know it's, it's a hard line to walk and again i will definitely talk about this with lauren is when's the appropriate time to criticize animal rights and veganism? And it's like, you don't want to sort of do it in public because then non-vegans latch onto it. Yeah, and they're like, definitely. ha, <laughs> you vegans are racist and you vegans are classist. And you're like, yeah, because there's people involved. So those issues are going to be in here, but people tend to grab those things and say, well, this is why I'm not personally going to go vegan. Um, and it's a really hard thing to do. And so it's a unique opportunity for vegans to talk to vegans. And of course there are some non-vegans there, uh, which actually kind of blows my mind. But um, some people go there just to get inspiration to go vegan. But for the most part, it seems like the safest large platform to talk about those issues. And every year there's, you know, a couple of panels that'll have like Lauren Ornelas or, you know, uh, Patrice Jones or Lisa Kemmerer or, you know, people that do uh, approach these issues from a more intersectional angle. Um, but it's often relegated to a small breakout panel and it'd be really great to see something like that as a plenary session. And I understand that it's super sensitive issue and people don't like being called racist or sexist and people don't react well to that. And so it might be really hard to do that on a larger scale, but, um, I would love to see a little bit more focus on including those issues and improving animal rights from that angle because, you know, rightfully so, um, the animal rights movement gets flack for being very white. And there are many, many, many wonderful people of color involved in the movement. But if you look around, it's like, yeah, there are a lot of white people here. And is that a problem? What can we do about it? How can we, you know, get more people on board that are currently feeling put off from the movement because vegans don't pay attention to certain issues. And even if they're not working on certain issues actively, at least not, you know, this goes back to episode one, yeah. not treading over those issues mm-hmm. or propping up against them. And yeah. And, and I honestly, like I've never been to the uh, animal rights conference, so I can't really say this, but it seems like this would be the place to have these discussions because I mean, you're in a place where there are some non vegans, non vegetarians, but for the most part, everyone is vegan. You don't, I don't, it doesn't seem like you need you need to have this like speakers that are saying why you shouldn't eat animals. It's, you'd just be preaching to the choir at that point. So I feel like they would be it would be a good place to have discussions that are saying like okay, this is what we need to do better. This is what we need to do to um, 
to benefit our our active our activism and um uh, yeah, that's it. It just seems like that would be the appropriate place to have these discussions. Yeah, and there, there's very little. This is why you should go vegan. Talks there. Yeah. It's all, oh, how do you raise money for a veg fest, or how do you talk to family members, or mm-hmm. how do you start a campaign? How do you get a student group going? It's all very good practical things. Yeah, and something that I'll, I'll certainly ask Lauren about is, you know, and something I struggle with, which is you learn about going vegan. And you're like, okay, done. Got it (laughs) under the belt. And then you go, and then uh, this happened for me. Um, I met Lauren three or four years ago at the Animal Rights Conference. We were tabling next to Food Empowerment Project. And one of their big um, projects is chocolate slavery and making sure people are aware of and not participating or supporting chocolate that's coming from certain areas of the country that support the most, you know, the worst forms of of child labor and, you know, reading a list of all the vegan companies that do use questionable labor sources made me really sad and it got me really fired up about it. And I have the app on my phone now and I always try and double check where my chocolate's coming from. And it seems really important. And it's like, okay, at what point do you drop that on someone? Like when you're trying to get them to go vegan, you don't want to go, Hey, go vegan. Also, check your chocolate. Look out for palm yeah. oil. Look out for this. Do this. Make sure you're getting your clothes from a thrift store. It's like, how do you introduce these things to people in a way that's going to be digestible? Because for a lot of people, going vegan is really hard. Yeah. Um, and so that's something that I struggle with. So I understand the monumental task that the organizers of the conference have figuring out the right balance because people yeah. come to that conference at all different levels of exposure. Um, but you know, we'll get into that in the interview. Yeah, that's that's tough. This is, <laughs> I mean, and this is this is very related to to episode one about there's just there's an infinite amount of problems going on in this world, and and you can't you can't tackle them all at once. But maybe you can if you take them either. I don't want to say one at a time, but if you take them small groups at a time, they, be, they become a lot more manageable. So if you go vegan first, focus on that, get yourself stable with that, and then look into like the palm oil or the um, the chocolate and then say like, okay, I can take my current lifestyle and just modify it a little bit to um, to so that I'm not supporting um, child labor. And then you can say, okay, there's this other issue. Then I only have to modify my lifestyle a little bit to now make sure I'm not supporting something else that's terrible going on. Yeah, my I have a, a friend, Lisa, who we don't get a, along on every issue. We often have spirited debates, but she looks at veganism uh, in a very healthy way. She is someone who is very into avoiding these sort of periphery issues or, or, or the products or whatever, mm-hmm. palm oil, chocolate, coffee, things like that, bananas that have a lot of issues with them. And she says, you know, veganism is, you know, about doing the best you can as far as practical and possible. And, you know, obviously there's a threshold because you can't say you're vegan if you're eating animal products, Yeah, but it's like, okay, you get all the animal products out. And then at this point, that's what's possible and practical to you. And then you start to educate yourself and you get to a point where, you're like, okay, it's practical for me to cut out chocolate or to check read labels mm-hmm. on chocolate or something. And so that's sort of that's the the gray area of the veganism and the ethical purchasing that happens is, you know, you know better, you do better, and sometimes that takes a little bit of time to transition as well. And I think a lot of vegan groups are are scared of talking about those things, probably rightfully so, because again, it's so much to put on someone when they're just getting exposed to something. Yeah. But it is, you know, it's to bring it back to the topic at hand. It's, it's something that I wish was maybe a little bit more, more prevalent in the conference. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I certainly don't have the answers, so I, I can't scold anyone for, for not figuring that out because, uh, it seems like it'd certainly be a really difficult thing to do. And, and just thinking about this now, this just popped in my head, maybe, um, Cause like I've, every time I hear about these types of things, like the chocolate, it's like, I want to to do something about it to stop supporting, um, those specific producers of chocolate. And, um, and there's that awesome app that, that lets, that help definitely helps you do that. But then it's like, you go to a party and someone's made something with chocolate and you're like, 
well, I know this is vegan, but I don't know where this chocolate is coming from. But maybe, and this is, I think this is incredibly difficult, maybe one way of going about it is to treat it like veganism, like when I first went vegan and I say, okay, I know what I'm not going to eat. I know all these things that I'm not going to eat. And it's like, it's not difficult for me to then avoid if, if I see chicken in something, it's not difficult for me to say, oh, okay, I cannot have that. I'm not going to have that. Maybe that's the way you want to do it with issues like the chocolate. It's like you really, you really figure out the stuff that you can have, the stuff that you can't have. Obviously there's going to be some stuff that you don't know about, but you figure out what you can and can't have. And then you treat it in the same way where you're like, okay, I'm going to have that. I'm not going to have that. And like with veganism, if you're unsure about something, then you kind of, you kind of have to make that call. You have to say like, well, this, this thing, I don't know exactly what's in it, but this does not look like it's vegan. So I'm going to, I'm going to avoid that. Maybe you can do the same thing with, um, with the chocolate situation so that's something maybe i'll try for myself i'll i'll get back to you i'll let you know how that goes but like there is so much stuff with the chocolate with the with the palm oil there's so many issues that we also want to think about in addition to just not eating animal products absolutely and uh the one bringing it back to the conference thing that sort of stuck out with me like i said i didn't really get to go to a lot of the sessions or any of the sessions i snuck away briefly for one veg fest planning session because it's a professional curiosity of mine. But I did sneak into, or I was legally allowed into, a, <laughs> the, uh, one of the closing plenaries of, of one of the days, and Ingrid Newkirk was speaking, and uh, there's obviously lots of hate levied against PETA. I'm certainly not a big fan of most of what they're doing, and I just sort of had a morbid curiosity of you know, what was Ingrid saying, because she is such a monumental person in the movement. I was just kind of curious. So I went in, and it was it was weird because she was mostly playing cute animal videos, <laughs> and uh, that was kind of bizarre to me. But I guess that gets people on your side. Um, but then she started talking about the parallels between animal rights and racism, and and knowing how PETA has very undelicately handled that in the past with like using the KKK comparison with the uh, American uh, kennel, like uh, the dog show. I started to cringe a little bit. And she got to a point where she, you know, said that, you know, animals are just a different race. And if you're not for animal rights, then you're certainly a racist. And that was just <laughs> not cool. Like, don't, don't do that kind of stuff, vegans out there. <laughs> like, I, you know, I, I know you, you want people to make those connections and there's so many parallels, but, you know, vegans get called all the time on just saying like, you don't care about black lives matter. You don't care about the issues that people of color face. And your only time you ever bring them up is when it's convenient for you. Cause you're like, Oh, I might be able to get this person that cares about racism to care about animal rights if I bring it up. And so it was super problematic and, you know, seeing an entire room full of people applauding that yeah. <laughs> really just made me very sad. And, you know, so something like that, I don't know what happened in all the other sessions. I can't say. Obviously, Ingrid wasn't in all of them. And there was some good panels that did talk about, you know, the color of animal rights and, you know, making f- vegan food accessible to low-income communities. That was a panel that uh, Lauren was on that, you know, obviously are not falling into those same uh, pitfalls. But mm-hmm. it, was, it was very disappointing to see. And especially it's like, okay, this is an icon of this movement ahead, the head of the largest and basically only publicly known vegan organization. Like if people associate veganism with PETA, you know, it's not like people are like, Oh yeah, PETA is all right, but I like mercy for animals and I like farm. It's like people don't, people, if they're not vegan, they don't know that. Yeah. And most vegans don't really know any of the other organizations. I know before I sort of got involved in going to veg fest and, and being a vendor, I knew about PETA. I knew about vegan outreach cause they leaflet, but that was it. So it's a bummer to see the, the face of the animal rights movement, really, at least from an activism side, um, saying those things and not being challenged and being applauded by the audience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and and it's a bummer because there are definitely ways, and I think it's necessary to to discuss and look at issues of racism and sexism through a vegan lens. Because at the end of the day, we want vegan to be about compassion. Um, and there are ways to, to have those discussions, but it doesn't seem like that was the that was the correct way to have it. it, it you know, it really somehow didn't leave <laughs> room for nuances in the discussion <laughs> when it's happening in a big big speech like that. Yeah. 
Yeah. But yeah, so I think that's a good place to sort of leave off that criticism and move into our interview with Lauren Arnellis because she has been around for a very long time and has a lot of great insight into those issues. And instead of having two white guys sitting around talking (laughs) about racism, it would be really great to bring Lauren into the conversation. So I think that's a good place to leave that conversation on the table. And we'll certainly get more in depth with Lauren in a little bit. I am, you know, really excited to have this interview because Lauren is someone that when I met, you know, four, four years ago, I was like, oh, this, like everything she said made so much sense, made me so excited about veganism. It, it got me as excited as when I first went vegan because Food Empowerment Project just got it mm-hmm. in ways that I didn't know someone could get it. I certainly didn't get it at that point, and maybe I still don't get certain things, but it just really, really made me very excited to think, okay, this could be the future of, of how we talk about veganism. So, you know, this will be the first interview on the show. Hopefully we'll have one every week. Sometimes it might just be the two of us talking about something that we're passionate about. But with the show, we want to get people on that are not necessarily out touring and promoting a book or some new project, but just people that are working in the movement have a lot of really good things to say. And, you know, we can highlight the work that they're doing and hopefully connect them with all of you. So let's take a quick break and then we will get right into our interview with Lauren Ornelas. Awesome. Hey everyone, this is Paul of The Bearded Vegans. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that The Bearded Vegans is part of the Commentist Network and you can find us on iTunes and Stitcher. And uh, I would encourage you to learn more about the show at thecommentist.com. That's T-H-E-C-O-M-M-E-N-T-I-S-T dot com. Uh, We also have a lot of other great shows on the Commentist Network. I do two other shows. Uh, One of them is called Continuous Improvement. That's just a kind of general positivity podcast. And then I do one uh, with my brother and some of my other friends called Roll to Hit, which is a Dungeons and Dragons podcast. So yeah, please check all those out. Uh, Thanks for listening again. And let's get back to the show. All right. Lauren Ornelas has been an animal rights advocate for over 20 years. She is the creator of veganmexicanfood.com and most notably the founder of the Food Empowerment Project, an animal rights, environmental, and social justice organization. Lauren, welcome to the Bearded Vegans. Thanks so much for having me on, you two. It's such a pleasure to have you. Uh, This is the first interview for our podcast, so really excited that you're on board for it. Yay, congratulations on your podcast. (laughs) Thank you. So I wanted to start off by just introducing our listeners to your work and specifically the work of the Food Empowerment Project. And I first learned about Food Empowerment Project when I was tabling next to you at the Animal Rights Conference three years ago. So this is actually probably our three-year friendversary. Um, but I was, I was really excited to learn about the approach that you're taking to animal rights and all these other issues. So could you explain for our listeners what the Food Empowerment Project is and the approach that you take to animal rights? Sure. I just want to say that we were excited to be next to Compassion Co. Um, with your great designs, as well as the fact that you were very careful on who you chose to be your t-shirt manufacturer. So it felt like... We, sh- we belong together. Um, so Food Empowerment Project is a, we call ourselves a vegan food justice organization. And we work to connect issues related to food and all forms of ex- oppression and exploitation for human and non-human animals and really spotlight those who are often seen as vulnerable and making sure that they aren't invisible and that we advocate for them. And we do that in a variety of ways. So in our, we promote veganism for ethical reasons, and we have a couple efforts related to that. Um, one is called Food Chain, a monthly newsletter to help people go and stay vegan. They get one issue a month for a year. And we also do outreach at a slaughterhouse on a monthly basis, a slaughterhouse that kills chickens. Um, we also, in promoting a vegan diet, we also want to recognize the workers who produced our food. So we advocate for the rights of farm workers by joining our voices with theirs in corporate, regulatory, and legislative efforts. But we also actually just got done doing a school supply drive for the children of farm workers last Saturday, where we um, handed out um, probably over 300 backpacks to children who are the children of farm workers, mostly from Oaxaca. 
And um, so that's kind of like, I always like to do a little bit of on-hands work as well. Um, and our next parts of our work, we work on trying to get people not to buy chocolate from the worst forms of child labor, including slavery. So we have a list that we maintain of chocolates we do and don't recommend. They have to at least make one vegan option. And the list is on our website. We also have an apps that you can download. And then we also work on access to healthy foods in communities of color and low-income communities. So that's right. our work in a nutshell. Yeah, very, very comprehensive. And so uh, the answer to this might be obvious um, because of all the things you just listed, but you started Food and Empowerment Project in 2006, correct? Correct. And, uh, you know, there's obviously lots of organizations out there, a lot of people doing work. Uh, What did you feel that needed to be brought to the table with Food and Empowerment Project that wasn't already there? Why create the Food and Empowerment Project? Well, I've been doing animal rights since the late 80s, and at the time in in 2006, I was running a organization called Viva USA where I did investigations of factory farms and slaughterhouses, and we ran corporate campaigns. But during that time, I was also is when I learned about what was happening in Western Africa for chocolate, and I started to talk about human rights issues um, and animal issues in the food industry, and a lot of animal rights activists did not like that I was talking about human animals and how they were exploited um, for food. And so I realized that I needed to start my own organization. Um, I spoke in 2006 at the World Social Forum in Caracas, Venezuela, and so many of the issues that I cared about were talked about. And I realized that I needed to start my own organization that combined human and non-human animal issues in a focused way around food so that we could try and, and make a difference and really hope to show other people how connected these issues are and that there are ways that we can work together and fight to create positive change. Awesome. And so with that, you mentioned animal advocates being upset that you're talking about human issues. Um, Do you find that that is still something that is persisting with the organization or do you find that vegan advocates are more open to those issues or do they still find what you're saying to be fairly controversial? Good question. I think that there are some people like yourself who understand and get our work. I still feel that's the minority of people in the animal movement. I More than not, I think we are approached by people when we talk to them about the chocolate issue whose response is, okay, but what does this have to do with animals? And who don't really seem to get that our work, that we do promote veganism and that how this work is connected. We have a lot of people who still, you know, want to say things like, oh, anybody can be vegan, they're getting their food from somewhere and things like that, without recognizing a lot of the inherent problems in in food distribution in society today. Um, So I think it's mixed. I feel like I I want to say, of course, we've been doing our job because we've been around for several years now that people are starting to get it and people are, you know, with the school supply drive. Um, It was amazing to me to see the outpouring of support by some of the vegans in the Bay Area, of course, as well as Latino community, really come out to support this. So I want to credit that somewhat to us, that people are starting to recognize as we're talking about these issues that we do need to be concerned about that. To me, at least, veganism is about justice. And, you know, my feelings about justice and compassion are not just limited to non-human animals. It includes everybody. And so since I'm not limited on how much I can care about something or the things that I can do, that that type of thinking is starting to hopefully be more common in the movement. Well, that's a glimmer of hope (laughs) for sure. Um, Do you find that certain aspects of the message that Food Empowerment puts forth are more controversial than others? Uh, You mentioned doing the school supply drive and Food and Empowerment Project website, food and, foodispower.org, has sections on the treatment of workers, uh, both for the produce workers, but also slaughterhouse and factory farm workers. And uh, for me personally, if I ever you know, post an article talking about the treatment of uh, slaughterhouse workers, for instance, I get a lot of pushback from vegans saying, well, why should we care about these people that are killing animals? Um, do you do you get that impression from a lot of vegans as well? Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things is people feeling like, well, these people can advocate for themselves. The animals can't do it without really having a full understanding of, of undocumented workers, of people who don't speak English or people who are um, 
well, exploited. When you look at slaughterhouse workers, I think this is this and a couple other things is when we look at the movement and say we're still not getting it, that we still have organizations um, and activists, unfortunately, that celebrate when workers are uh, put in jail for cruelty to animals. Now, obviously, what's happening with the abuse that happens to the animals is horrific, and obviously slaughtering is horrific, but nobody wants to slaughter animals all day. And this is these people's job, but for how long? We know the industry has a 100% turnover rate, so people who are doing this business are not in it for very long, and yet we celebrate um, when they... Oh, God, Andy, so now I'm rambling. No, I, I want you to ramble. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was just going to ask, why, why should we care about... Uh, slaughterhouse workers and why should we care about factory farm workers and you were just naturally segueing right into that so um, <laughs> well, you're welcome to keep talking on that subject and, and <laughs> if, if you were talking to someone who was like okay I'm vegan now and um, and then you're like okay let's talk about slaughterhouse workers what would you say to them to to get them to realize why people should care about slaughterhouse workers well I would Tell them they should care because we shouldn't want any living being to be abused or exploited. But knowing that brand new vegan is going to feel very self-righteous and doesn't get why the rest of the world doesn't understand why everybody should be vegan, which I understand that feeling, um, that understanding veganism is to understand a system uh, that oppresses and exploits and has absolutely no regard for the the life of another being and that's the same thing when we look at this industry when we look at slaughterhouse workers they, they don't care about them they don't care about tearing them apart from their families no differently than how a cow and a baby calf are taken away the separation of families that takes place in these industries they don't care and again I'm not equating suffering here I'm simply saying that these are industries that have no problem separating families these are industries that have no problem hurting people exploiting people People, you know, a animals are killed in the slaughterhouses. Some slaughterhouse workers are accidentally killed in, this, in these facilities. You know, and getting them to care is just trying to remind them that the connectedness of these oppressions and these exploitations, this is a capitalistic system that seeks to do nothing but to harm others um, for profit. All right. Well, that's a, certainly a great answer. And you mentioned, you know, people celebrating when workers go to prison after these undercover investigations. I wonder if you could expand a little bit more on that, on why you find that to be problematic. I'd like to pretend like I'm very well educated on the whole industrial prison complex, but I'm not. But what I will say that, you know, that's problematic. But what's more problematic, again, is who is it that's going to jail? Who is it that's going to prison? It's these people who are working in these facilities, who are exploited, who are taken advantage of, and the people on top, the owners of these facilities, are the ones who nothing happens to them. They may get a slap on the wrist of, the, of a fine, but they're going to go back and they're going to do this all over again. So basically, we're putting people in prison and we're basically blaming the victims. These workers are exploited by this industry and the people on top who are the ones responsible, who are setting the speed lines, who are, well paying the workers and treating the workers in no doubt inhumane ways are the ones who nothing's going to happen to them. And this is going to, this, the system is going to continue. And it's not holding those accountable, accountable who should be held accountable. So I always see these kinds of situations as blaming the victims. Yeah, so it's essentially, it's sort of treating a symptom, but not the root of the cause. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Well, so moving uh, into another section of the Food and Empowerment Project, uh, you mentioned the chocolate list and, and working on getting people to make sure they're not purchasing chocolate from the worst forms of child labor. And could you just talk a little bit more about that project? It's, it seems like it's one of the flagship um, projects of the Food and Empowerment Project. Thank you. Yeah, I, I got involved in this in 2000 when I saw a segment from England on a former slave um, who'd escaped working in the cacao or the chocolate industry. And he said to the Western reporter, said, what would you say to Westerners who still eat chocolate? And he said, when you eat chocolate, you're eating my flesh. And it reminded me of the same thing as a non-human animal would say. And I knew I couldn't look at chocolate the same way anymore. And so when I started Food Empowerment Project, I decided I wanted to incorporate that, that we can't really say this is a cruelty-free chocolate bar 
um, if it's tainted with slavery or it's tainted with child labor, where you have children in Western Africa and countries like, say, the Ivory Coast who are trafficked hundreds of miles away from home, who are sometimes locked in at night, who are beaten if they don't work fast enough. Um, so, you know, how can something like that really be cruelty free? And we've been really pushing the vegan movement on this because we are people who understand uh, that it's, it, regardless of what our taste buds might feel like, it's not worth the suffering that goes into it. So why would we then support or buy from companies that are using child labor or worse, child slavery um, to pick the cacao? So that's why we recommend, you know, vegan chocolate for no suffering of non-human animals. And then we use our list of chocolates. When I started talking about this issue, um, people would be like, okay, what chocolate can I buy? And so that's kind of where the birth of our chocolate list came from, where we go out and we contact companies who make a vegan chocolate and we find out where they source their cacao from. And if it's sourced from Western Africa, except for a few exceptions, we don't recommend um, from Western Africa. And we, we update this list on a monthly basis and we invite people, if your favorite vegan chocolate is not on the list, that we would be happy to contact them. And we give companies three tries over a month and a half to two months in order to at least get back to us. And for companies, you know, we've had some companies switch suppliers, which is great. And more than anything, the first step in our effort is transparency. So we, as you know, we had a campaign against Cliff Bar to get them to disclose the country of origin for their chocolate. And we feel like this is almost always the first step is to get companies to disclose the country of origin and to show that they, they're going to be held accountable, that the public does care about where the chocolate comes from and that corporations can't say, um, you know, it's proprietary information on such a serious issue such as child labor and slavery. And for those listening, uh, I'd like to just give a quick plug to the, the app that you have. The, the Chocolate List is the name of it, correct? Yes. And that is a list you can download for your phone that can receive updates. And if you're just shopping at a store, you can just quickly look up you know, this chocolate bar and see if it meets the Food Empowerment Project's recommendation or not. Uh, and you mentioned the Cliff Campaign, Cliff Bar Campaign. I wanted to ask... You know, why target Cliff Bar? What made you think that was a winnable campaign? And what was the experience like trying to get Cliff Bar to, you know, reveal the source of their chocolate? I always make this assumption that because a company seems like they care about the environment and they care about sustainability, that that's overall how the company feels about things. So I didn't think Cliff Bar was going to end up being a campaign. I thought we'd be able to write them a letter and they would disclose to us country of origin. Mind you, we're not asking for the state, the city, or anything, even the name of the farm, just the simple country. And the fact that they wouldn't disclose was very shocking to us. So we ended up having the campaign for over three years. And unfortunately, I, I, unfortunately, it was really hard to get vegan activists because Cliff Bar primarily makes vegan products. It was very difficult to get vegan activists on board. Most of them wanted to defend Cliff Bar. And this is the same problem I had when I ran a Whole Foods Market several years ago, is that everybody thinks they're already doing everything right, and we find out they may are, maybe are messing up on some things. And a lot of people didn't want to hold Cliff Bar accountable. So I believe that they would be a good campaign target because they all are all about sustainability. Most of their products were vegan, and again, we were only asking country of origin. Um, it was hard for us to get enough signatures from people on the petition. It was really hard to get vegans to want to sign a petition to Cliff Bar. Um, but thanks to efforts um, that we joined up with Care2, we ended up getting over 83,000 signatures on our petition, most of which, after having the petition for over two years, most of these signatures were obtained in a matter of months. And we were set to deliver the petitions on December 10th, which is Human Rights Day, to the Cliff Bar headquarters here in the Bay Area. And a few days before that, they decided to disclose country of origin to us. They still um, source from Western Africa, so we don't recommend them. But at least they showed that they don't feel they're above transparency. And corporate transparency is just really key, um, I think, uh, to getting companies to be held accountable for these issues. And so, um, again, 
so many of these problems that we talk about aren't things that you can shop or eat your way out of, that we can make these personal choices, but we have to use our voices and combine them together in order to help create change in, in a larger level. And that's what we're trying to do. Oh, right on. And, you know, congratulations on the Cliff Bar victory, even if it wasn't, you know, I, I, perhaps it was the answer we were all expecting to receive. Um, you yeah. know, it was not the answer that we wanted to hear. Um, and something that uh, Paul and I were talking about earlier in our episode that ties right into this is that all of this can seem overwhelming and, you know, certainly going vegan is a very overwhelming thing for most people when they first start out. And, uh, a lot of us go through this, these phases of, okay, I'm vegan. I'm awesome. I'm doing everything right. And then you start to realize, oh, just because I'm vegan, I'm not doing everything right. And just because someone else is vegan doesn't mean they're this perfect person. And that's something that we're hoping to explore a lot with this podcast. Um, But we were trying to reflect on how do you expose someone to these messages? Do you feel like dropping everything on someone all at once, like saying you have to go vegan and you have to care about this and this and this? is too much or is do all these issues deserve the attention um, immediately? Um, do you have any advice for people that are trying to get others aware of issues beyond basic veganism? Right. I agree with you completely on, you know, veganism can be so overwhelming. And one of the things in our work with food chain that I'm realizing is that one of the things we don't do enough of in this movement is really help people walk through their life now in a sense that it's overwhelming and it changes everything about how you live your life. And it's really painful too to realize that so much in our world involves the exploitation and killing of animals. But I know that wasn't your specific question, but it is overwhelming. I think that in and of itself is is massive. I know that I always try and end a lot of my talks with like, I know this is can be overwhelming, but I hope you can look at it as an opportunity. And I think I try to look at it in terms of opportunities um, to help create a better world. You know, these are opportunities. I mean, we should be looking at these as gifts in a sense, that there's so much suffering in the world, but these are opportunities to try and not participate in that suffering, to try and stop some of that suffering, Um, rather be vegan or not buying chocolate. I mean, personally, I think there are some things that, just like I think veganism, you know, is if people have access to healthy food, should do immediately to eliminate some of the suffering in the world. But I also really strongly feel that way about chocolate as well. I don't, chocolate's a luxury. Nobody needs to buy chocolate um, sourced from slavery and child labor. That's inexcusable in my opinion. Um, So I do think that there are some things like that that's hands down. I mean, when you look at what's happening with farm workers, we can't stop eating produce. Everybody needs it. So there's other ways that we can make changes. When it comes to palm oil, I mean, I do my best not to consume it at all. I mean, that's one way, although I'm sure it's in cosmetics products that I buy, but, you know, there are slowly ways, but if we can try not look at these as um, overwhelming and just really start to look at these like, wow, here's a label, you know, I can read this chocolate says it comes from Ecuador. I can consciously make this decision. How lucky am I? I mean, these, this is what we, in privileged society and privileged individuals, obviously not everybody in the United States, but these are opportunities to do good, to try and take a stance and, you know, speak out to these corporations that I would just, I'm not saying I don't get that it's overwhelming. I mean, trust me, I get vegans and then I, and I speak about food empowerment project and there's like this overall sigh, like, aren't I doing enough? But I think that we're that way a little bit to environmentalists who are maybe doing absolutely everything that they possibly can to be good to the environment. And then we're like, ah, and then veganism. And they're like, "Ah, I'm already doing everything I can. Now you want me to do this. And I think that we need to understand that we come across that way sometimes too. And so, yeah, now I'm rambling again. But (laughs) I just want people to look at these things as much as we can. That If I look at my laptop or I look at other things that are, produced um, that I need that I, I don't have as much control over. I, you know, I need my computer in order to do work, although I know it's, you know, the people in China from, you know, Sony or whatever probably aren't treated the best, but I need this, that there are a lot of things that it's hard to control and eliminate some of the suffering. But with our food, we have such an opportunity to make an immediate difference. Right on. Well, that certainly seems like a, a positive note to end off the interview on. Um, is there any areas of, of your work or food empowerment that you feel was left out of the interview that you wish you could highlight? Um, 
Well, uh, we all you have veganmexicanfood.com you mentioned earlier, but we're always happy to people to donate recipes to us. Um, to help keep our website growing and we hope that people will check us out on social media and you know sign up to our email list and you know get involved um, get involved with and support organizations and businesses like Compassion Co that meet your ethics that it's about veganism but it's also about not not perpetuating any more oppression suffering and exploitation in this world and uh, what is next for you? Do you have any big projects on the horizon? Is everything secret right now? Or do you have any future things that you're we're working on? Well, I'll tell you one of them. Um, we are one of the our work areas on access to healthy food in Vallejo, California, which is in between San Francisco and Sacramento. We found that Safeway was putting a deed on their former property saying that no other grocery store could move into that property for 14 years. And we're finding out that this is an area that has severe lack of access to healthy foods. So we're in communication with Safeway right now and um, to see if they'll change this policy to make sure that they don't put, um, well, damaging deeds on property that impacts community health. And if they don't listen to us, then we might be asking for your listeners to help us out and demand that Safeway change this policy. Well, we'll certainly be sure to keep everyone updated on that as the developments progress. Um, cool. Well, all right. Well, I think this is a good place to leave it off. People can find out more about the Food Empowerment Project by going to foodispower.org. There's a lot of really great resources and information on there that I suggest everyone go and explore as soon as possible. Uh, Lauren, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you, Andy and Paul. <laughs> Awesome. So that concludes our interview with Lauren Ornelas. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the show. Like we said, we're going to try to have some more very interesting interviews and discussions in the future. Uh, please subscribe to us on iTunes and Stitcher, The Bearded Vegans, and uh, also check us out on thecommentist.com. Yeah, and please send in your comments. Let us know what you liked, what you didn't like, guests that you would like to see us talking to. Any ideas you have, we love to get feedback. We want to make this yours as much as it is ours. And, you know, we want this to be us vegans talking to vegans, having those conversations, like we said, that, sh that should be taking place between vegans and figuring out, you know, what do we need to be talking about? How do we make this movement better? And, you know. And you can send those into thebeardedvegans at gmail.com. <laughs> All right, that, that, that wraps up our episode number two. Uh, Join us for episode three, where we will be doing a review of the new film, Unity, from the creators of Earthlings. I don't eat no meat, no dairy, no sweets, only ripe vegetables, fresh fruit and whole wheat. I'm from the old school, my household smell like soap. No, after after all this time, don't know what's what's stopping him at this point. But um, yeah, I've definitely had a very encouraging family, and I and I'm lucky because I know other people who, when they've lived at home, when they said to their mom or dad or whoever that they've gone vegan, they've basically reacted by saying, "Okay, well now you can you can do all the cooking for yourself, you can buy all this food for yourself. I'm not going to support you at all." But um, that being said. I do try whenever, whenever something comes up, like whenever something comes up naturally, I definitely try to interject with with some facts about how either this meat is made or or how these animals are treated. Um, I de don't keep quiet about that because, especially because, I found that there's there's so many misconceptions that that non vegans and vegans too have about how this food how their food is made. And um, one of the most important things is just getting them exposed to the truth that that it's it's this awful stuff is is going on in factory farms. Uh, so so whenever something comes up organically, I'll definitely bring it up. Um, whenever there's like a, a vegan event, I try to encourage my my fam my immediately family immediate family to attend something like um, there's the screening of the new movie Unity that's going on in. 
in well at the time record this podcast it's going on next week but i'm encouraging my family to go to that um but overall i i think just being vegan and and i'm not even saying this to kind of cop out but just being vegan and exposing my family and my friends to this new kind of food it it does erase a lot of their misconceptions about veganism. It shows them that vegan food can taste good. It shows them that there are easy ways to convert non-vegan food into vegan food. And um, just being vegan, I think, helps helps uh, promote the idea that veganism is something that's obtainable. And if someone was maybe hesitant about trying it out because they thought it would be too difficult, it kind of helps them to to know that they should try it out. Absolutely. There's definitely a lot to be said for being the vegan in the room, even if you're not being the outspoken vegan in the room. And I'm sure that's something that all of us struggle with is when do you speak out? When do you push back further? uh, Or when do you just sort of lay back, maintain presence and interject a little bit here and there when you can? I am, I am also very lucky in that my family has been very supportive of my veganism. My sister actually went vegetarian when she was very young when she found out what uh, goes into hot dogs. <laughs> it horrified her, and she went vegetarian at, I want to say, 10, some, somewhere cool. very young. And, of course, I teased her about it for a very long time, <laughs> as most uh, you know, meat eaters do tend to uh, tease those that do not eat meat. But... My mom recently went vegetarian, which is uncomfortable. Well, um, I mean, being a vegan, it's, it's, my, it's one of my life philosophies that I don't think that we have the right to exploit any other living creature, whether that's human or animals. So having – even though these animals were treated, let's say, much better than they would be treated on a factory farm or um, – or even a larger farm, like I said, this was a very small farm, they were still, the animals were still being used for for profit, basically. They, they didn't just have these animals just to have them, they were using them for profit, which I think is the thing that even though the goats were leading pretty great lives, they went on hikes almost daily, uh, they were still being, they were still being used, I guess. That's the thing that made me feel the most uncomfortable. Yeah, I think that, you know, often people uh, confuse factory farming with being what vegans are against. Um, And and, I heard a really great quote over the weekend, actually, that was saying factory farming is a symptom of the problem. It's not the problem itself. So, you know, when you get down to it, it's not so much how badly an animal is treated, although obviously there are degrees of cruelty and less cruelty is preferable, um, but just the fact that an animal is being exploited at all is the problem. So I can definitely see why that would make you feel uncomfortable, especially because right now it's, it's right in front of your face. Here is this animal that um, is, you know, lovely, lovely hiking <laughs> companion, uh, yet at the end of the day, the the family has them around because they can... Uh, turn some sort of profit for them. Yeah, and it's it's a bummer because I mean obviously I I love my cousin. I love hanging out with them. They're they're wonderful people. Um and maybe it's just and they are they're definitely I think more conscious of they're more conscious of let's just say animal um animal issues than the than the normal person. But um but maybe it's just it's just a, a product of the the culture, the fact that we live in a culture where if you're going to be a farmer, it is more profitable for you to have, for you to own animals and, and use the animals rather than just having vegetables. Like I don't, I don't personally know that that's a fact, but um, I, I mean, maybe, maybe that's why, like, that's why they have these animals is because just having, they wouldn't really be able to, uh, to live on just having the vegetables, so maybe that's a that's another thing uh, that just came to my head just now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's certainly a complicated issue. I, I, normally, I would say, well, there's big government subsidies for animal products, but obviously, on such a small scale operation, um, how many animals would you say that they have? Um, it was about so it was four goats. There was about seven pigs, and then maybe seven chickens. And where do the do they ever sell them for meat? Are they just using them for their their milk? Uh, the goats just for the milk. A very nice. big step, and I'm very proud of her. 
And both of my parents lean strongly towards vegetarian and vegan food. They have no problem making it for me when I come over. I'm usually buying them vegan cookbooks. They're big fans of the Dr. Furman, you know, camp, the eat to live system. So I, I often buy things of that nature for them and they're always excited to try things. But, you know, I have some, just like you, I have some family members on the periphery that are generally pretty cool about it. But, you know, early on, especially I had one, one family member who, uh, you know, was like, uh, you better not start burning down fur farms <laughs> and well, what are your shoes made of? And you have to milk cows and, and dealing with that is, is hard because if it's a random stranger on the street that you don't have to see again, it's easy to sort of maybe give that tough love kind of response and, and then write it off. You know, obviously you want to be the best advocate possible. And usually that requires being calm and collected mm -hmm. and, and just being a good representation, which is an unfair burden to place on vegans, but it is still the burden that we bear. And knowing the, the stakes at hand, all, you know, these billions of animals that are uh, slaughtered every year for, for food and entertainment and testing and whatnot, it is important for us, in my eyes, to to do the best we can to be the best advocates possible. And as far as that goes in relation to family members, I don't know if it was in the Animal Activist Handbook, um, but it was some some book I read, you know, way early on when going vegan. And the advice they gave was not to get hung up on converting family members, which I think is really good advice for maintaining your well being with uh with regards to it because you can really it'll really just drive you up the wall if you're just focusing in on getting your family members to get it and to go vegan because sometimes it will happen it's not always going to happen and if you're just so focused on getting one or two people to do this thing that they're not doing and the more you do it the more pushback you get it's not going to be good for anyone. It's going to strain your family relationships if you have good family relationships. And it's not going to help the animals because it's not going to you know, get anyone on board. So it is a tough line to walk. Yeah, you definitely don't want to create like a rift between you and your family members or even your friends because it, like you were saying, it, it, can, it can affect your emotional state. And that's – it's like you want to, you want to stay healthy too if, if thinking about the animals, if you want to be the best vegan advocate you could be, I mean you got to – take care of yourself as well yeah so it sounds like we're both in a different position than some people might be or maybe even most people yeah. where we've had family members that have been supportive of it and you know i have friends who just like you said their their parents were like you're cooking now and when i do vegan uh, education work for younger people you know high school students especially they're great to talk to because usually they haven't been exposed to the issue before and they're more affected by it and they're more wanting to make the change, but they're also in a position where they're not the primary food. I don't eat no meat, no dairy, no sweets, only ripe vegetables, fresh fruit and whole wheat. I'm from the old school. My household smell like soul. Hello and welcome to episode two of The Bearded Vegans. I'm Paul. And I'm Andy. And we are The Bearded Vegans, a podcast featuring our dissection of all things vegan. If you're just tuning in for the first time, you can reach us by emailing thebeardedvegans at gmail.com. And you can find all of our previous episodes on the Commentist Network at thecommentist.com. In today's episode, we'll be talking about navigating life as a vegan among non-vegan family members, moving on into a rundown of the 2015 National Animal Rights Conference, and concluding with an interview with Lauren Ornelas, the founder of the Food Empowerment Project. All right, Paul. So this is episode two, and uh, a lot has happened since we last spoke. Um, and we'll start with you. You went up to Maine and had an experience with some family members, and that sort of spurred our topic of wanting to talk about how to navigate life with, with non-vegan family members, something basically every single vegan can relate to. Uh, so what was your experience like uh, that caused you to want to talk about this topic? So I went up, as Andy said, visited uh, some my cousin and her husband in Maine, and they own a very small farm. It's basically just the two of them, uh, my cousin's brother-in-law, and then his partner that uh, that work on this farm. So it's a very very small farm, and it's 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 awesome. It's it's got it's about ninety percent vegetables, but uh, there are a few animals. They have 
four goats, one of them they milk, they have a few chickens for eggs, and then they have a few pigs, which they mostly just use to, to clear to clear out some of the land of, of vegetation, but eventually they are going to sell those pigs. And uh, I had a great time with them, it was awesome, um, but I couldn't shake this kind of uncomfortable feeling that I had about being on an a farm that had animals. And we did get to do a lot of cool stuff with the animals. I obviously love hanging out with animals. We went on a couple hikes with the goats. I did not know that goats were good uh, hiking companions, but they're basically easier to uh, easier to hike with than, than dogs because they pretty much just stick with you wherever you go. They'll stop when you stop and they'll keep going when you go. So that was a pretty magical experience for me. But like I mentioned, this whole time I kind of just had this underlying uncomfortable feeling about uh about hanging out with these animals yeah well that's that's an interesting experience because most of us can relate to living with non-vegan family members certainly having non-vegan friends and uh it's not often that that is sort of put right in front of you because obviously most of them are eating animals and whatnot but here you have these actual live animals in front of you so what about being with those animals made you feel the chickens i believe just for the eggs and then the pigs like i said they were using them because pigs are great at just if there's a lot of vegetation they'll just eat up the vegetation real quick so they were kind of they had them so that they would clear the land of vegetation and then i think when those pigs get older they are going to sell them for meat yeah so yeah that's definitely a difficult reality to, to face yeah and and I mean I think obviously because because it's my cousin and I and I love her it's like I want to I have this gut reaction to defend the farm when I'm talking about it with other people but then at the same time I'm like oh wait I I I don't agree with this I don't want I wish that uh I wish that it wasn't this way but I it it's I didn't it's not something that I discussed with them they they know that I'm I'm vegan and they know how I feel um but at the same time, I felt like I felt like it wasn't it wasn't my place to say anything about it because I don't know anything about farming. I'm I felt uncomfortable saying like, no, this is you're not. This is how you should live, and like this is how the, because this is how they're making their money. And it, it was it would be an uncomfortable conversation to say like, no, you're you can't do this this way that you're making money, which. I mean, is it's funny because if this was a random person, I would have I would have no problem saying it to them, but uh, just the personal the personal family connection is what makes it much more difficult, and that's why I wanted to to bring up this topic about talking to your family or just about how to deal with it, how to deal with non vegan family members. Yeah, and I think that at, at this point, that actually splits the conversation into two sections. One of which is um, how to, how to talk to people about small scale operations, even stuff like backyard eggs, um, and and how to explain that those things are unethical, at least in our eyes. Uh, and the other conversation is what we want to get to the core of, which is how to talk to family members. At how far do you push? Um, at what point? Is it maybe more beneficial to stay silent? Are you going to cut people off more than actually bring them over? So uh, that's certainly a good transition. I think we can steer it in the direction of just how to talk to family members, even if they don't happen to have a farm, if they're just going and picking up burgers at the store. And so when you're in general, when you're talking to family members about this stuff, do you talk to family members about this stuff? Is it something that you never bring up? Is it only when they bring it up? Do they tease you about it? (laughs) What's the current dynamic with you and your family and in regards to veganism? Uh, Well, first of all, I want to put it out there that I'm I'm very lucky in that I have an immediate family that is incredibly accepting and encouraging of uh, my vegan lifestyle. Uh, my dad has been vegetarian for over 30 years. And, and since I've gone vegan, he's, he's moved towards veganism. He's, he likes to, every time I bring it up, he likes to say that he's 90% vegan. Um, I, I still like, don't, 